Hello, I'm Philip Ruprecht. I'm a faculty member of, uh, in volcanology at the University of Nevada, Reno. We're here at uh, Soda Lakes, one of the stops of the field guide. Uh, we're near the town of Fallon, about an hour away from Reno. And uh, we're standing on the side of the Soda Lake Mar, which is a phreatomagmatic eruption uh, that occurred in Holocene times um, about potentially 10,000 years ago, maybe uh, a lot younger. This the age is still to be fully determined. Uh, what you can see is that this is really a Mar eruption where the eruption produced a lot of surges that were laterally extensive and created this very gentle slope up to the crater. And in the next few stops, what I want to show you is a couple of the deposits and a look into the crater itself. All right, so we are now on the southern uh, rim of the, of the Great Soda Lake, looking into the Mar itself. Um, the Mar is uh, about a mile wide in diameter. It's a pretty large lake and pretty large Mar eruption. This is the major major eruption that occurred uh, as part of this this magmatic event. There is a second little lake that is to the southwest of here. Uh, that is this little Soda Lake that is about a few hundred. As we look into the, the crater, we can see uh, that the deposits are primarily uh, limited to the eastern, northern, and, and southwestern part, where things are thickest. That may be because the eruption itself was somewhat directional towards the east. It may also be that the wind, as it is blowing today from the west, blew, blows most of the deposits that way as well. What we want to do in the, in the next few stops is look at the deposits in greater detail. And so we will go to uh, cliffs that you can see here. These cliffs still being well preserved, uh, showing us, uh, giving us an opportunity to look at, at these tephra deposits and the succession of the mar. And then we will also look at some other deposits on the, on the other side of the crater uh, to, to look in, in, into some of the volcanic features there. Uh, the last thing that I want to point out is that as you look around the, the edge of the lake, you have a lot of white colors. These are uh, tufa deposits associated with this very alkaline uh, rich lake that uh, leads to precipitation uh, of tufa. So let's go to the next step. So this clip uh, was affected by too much wind noise and therefore I would rather provide a voiceover. What we're looking at here is one of the cliffs that are still well exposed and they show uh, a lot of detail about the deposits of phreatomagmatic eruptions that are produced in Mars. Uh, what you need to know is that the external driver, uh, that the driver for these eruptions is external water, uh, typically brought in by aquifers. In this area here, uh, we are in the Carson Sink where a lot of water is stored in the basin. And so um, as this aquifer water was um, interacting with a rising magma, it flashed to steam, provided a lot of explosive energy uh, that led to the formation of this mar. Let's take a look uh, at the deposits. Um, you have, generally speaking, a very thick sequence that is layered and that is produced during lateral transport of different kinds of flow units. They are technically called dilute pyroclastic flows. These deposits are not well sorted. You can have coarse and fine material really all mixed together uh, and you don't really identify any kind of breaks in time that would be um, visible through layers that are purely fine ash that can settle in times of, of, of quiescence. Instead, we have all sorts of mixed in material of various grain sizes and, and that are produced during these lateral uh, transport in what we call base surges. If we go a little bit deeper in, 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 into greater detail into the system, what we can see is that there is a uh, variations and abundance of coarser and finer material within dif different layers, both in terms of fragmented country rock as well as in terms of uh, juvenile material that make up the deposit, where the juvenile material is the magma that rose and drove, uh, drove the eruption. This layer in particular that I'm pointing out right now has a bunch of co coarser material and a lot of darker class in them, which are the juvenile material. And so this was potentially a time when the explosive phase was a little drier with less external water driving country rock fragmentation. 
and relatively more of the juvenile material was being deposited. The more water, um, as, as the eruption continued, more water may have come back into the aquifer, driving more explosive energy available for finer fragmentation of the deposits. Uh, and, and so they, the higher up deposits then tend to be dirtier, meaning more abundance of locally derived fragments from the country rock. So this is a typical kind of deposit you can see associated with more eruptions. And if you look at the entire sequence, these probably uh, these deposits probably took a few days to deposit. We can estimate this from historic eruptions like the Yukinrik Mar eruption in the Alaska Peninsula in 1977, where a, a similar eruption took about 10 days. So we just moved a little bit further to the east and still on the south, southeastern, southeastern side of the, the Mar. And this is a beautiful spot where you can really see these dune forms that develop during Mar style eruptions. Erosive surfaces, um, cut, crust cutting, um, previously deposited layers, and then themselves being crust cut again by another layer. Um, so these are highly dynamic environments where the depositional and erosional dep you know, environments uh, frequently change and dune forms of this kind are, are quite common. So this can be best seen in these more finer deposits. And then you can see as this, this eruption continued, it became a little bit uh, coarser, maybe a little bit drier. It also looks like it became more abundant of larger uh, basaltic fragments. Again, something we saw in, in, on the previous spot as well. And uh, these bigger clasts were still isolated to some specific layers, but some of these big clasts are not just, uh, many of these big clasts are probably ballistics that were just, uh, un unlike the surge that is mostly a lateral transport, these are ejected first as a ballistic up and then they fall down. And that's true for some of the, uh, not for this one, but I'll show you in a moment one, one other one. Um, that's true for basaltic clasts as well as um, country rock class and especially this one up here you can nicely see the sag structures associated with this uh, mudstone that is derived from the country rock that as it was falling or first ejected as a ballistic up into the air was falling onto the ground and starting to deform the already existing um, stratified layers um, and so it was landing like in a little soft net and then deposition continued um, further. All right, so we, we're still on the southwest uh, eastern side of the Mar, and now we just are looking right at the at the shoreline of the lake, where you can see the the long time precipitation of these tufa mounds that that pr were produced as as spring water that came up along faults, probably uh, derived from the explosive event that created, of course pathways and, and especially a ring fracture of some sort. So fluids that come through those uh, come in contact with the lake water and the changes in temperature and alkalinity lead to precipitation of these, these tufa mounds that are actually making a beautiful kind of alignment here, probably mapping out one of those fractures where waters can come up. And the, you can see in a few space, uh, spots within the lake uh, these kinds of deposits. So they are not all around the entire lake, but uh, uh, somewhat localized. And here is, is one particularly nice way to look at it. All right, a, uh, one more last spot looking at some of the sedimentary aspects of, uh, of this mar. We're now on the northern side of the lake. So the shades are a little different. Um, there, is, there is quite a bit of stack structures you can see here. So ballistics that fall and then create uh, a little channel that then later gets filled. So here you see a little a big class that kind of definitely disturbed the underlying layers and created a little hole that then was filled in this case by a lot of juvenile class rich material and then later was covered again by more, more uh, laterally extensive deposits. The same you can see over in this class also a little class that created a little sag that then was filled uh, with the more basaltic, larger clasts. So this was in a place where energy 
was so that these could be collected. Uh, the energy conditions were so that these, these clasps could be collected in this little divot and then were covered afterwards. Another little sec structure from this you can see over there. Plenty of bed that gets cut, cross cut. Here is another example. And, and in some cases where you can really see the pinching out, sometimes because of, of cross cutting, but also just because of thinning of these layers as you look laterally. So these are not laterally extensive. Within a few meters, um, they can change their character. Uh, but some of them, of course, do expand, extend over larger areas as well. So really a fantastic lab to, to look at these volcanic features and these deposits um, in great detail. And so you should come out and, and take a look. And we have one last stop to actually look at the basalts and what they are made out of to just uh, discuss that as well. All right, now we're just having a quick look at the mineralogy and and what the juvenile material actually looks like. This is a big class. You can see it's a, a maybe 20 centimeters um, in diameter. It's actually just half the size of the class we found in one of the deposits here. Um, and uh, so these ballistics can be quite quite large. And and again, maybe they range up to yeah 40 centimeters or so. They are actually documenting that the magma really is ripping. Uh, up some of the country rock and you can see this beautifully in this piece where you have a class the lithic from the country rock enclosed um, that was just picked up on ascent and and brought to the surface this way and another one right here these are basalts um, there is some plage in there but they are really uh, show beautiful olivine crystals and you can see some um, you know a few millimeter large olivine crystals right here that are beautiful olive green and and they are quite quite easily visible throughout these basaltic um, uh, blocks and this is uh, yeah one of the biggest ones this one is pretty dense uh, you can sometimes find others that look a little bit more vesiculated like this one over here right but those are rare the majority of them don't really have the time to expand uh, because of the interaction with the groundwater, they get either shattered quickly to fine ash or they, they cool still sufficiently quickly to not really expand in great detail uh, or great amounts. Um, you can still see some of the plage and olivines uh, sparkling in the, in, the, in the evening or afternoon sunlight here. Um, many of the class really are looking like little um, like little bombs of that, that nature here, a little irregular. They are not, again, highly vesiculated. We break them open. Uh, we can see a bunch of plagioclase and, and some xenocrysts in there. Um, there are some olivines actually right there that looks like there is some reaction going on. Um, anyhow, these are this is the typical makeup of these clasts. Let's break up one more to see. What they look like and here you go see these are uh, with abundant plage or not abundant but some plage and, and and olivine in particular as the major phases that are juvenile and here is another big xenolith a xenocryst of, of quartz presumably all right so this is the kind of mineralogy that you can find out here and uh, we hope to have shown you quite a bit of, of soda lake uh, you should come out and uh, and enjoy the other stops of the virtual tour as well.